I've got no plywood storage. I've got no means of protecting my current and future 3D printers from this dusty woodshop environment. So today I'm gonna tackle both of those issues with one massive upgrade to my shop. But don't be fooled, this isn't your typical plywood box that's only for storing your overflow sheet goods. It's got a ton of trick features, most of which are unnecessary, but I guarantee it's like nothing else you've seen before. Yes! So contrary to popular belief, having a larger shop does not mean you have unlimited space to work in. So today I was on a mission a mission to conserve as much of that valuable shop floor real estate as I could. And because I'm a rebel, Gentlemen, welcome to Fight Club. I decided to go against the grain and not build the famous mobile plywood cart you see flooded on the internet. Now, don't get me wrong, I see the benefits in that design. I understand the need to roll 40 sheets of four by eight material around your workspace, dodging the clutter and the extension cords, to then only realize that it's stored in the most inconvenient orientation to be able to feed onto a table saw or a workbench. So for me and my layout, that option was out. So I've decided on this back corner of my shop to make this the permanent location for this new enclosure. Now this is naturally where I've been storing my sheet goods anyways, and I didn't see a lot of better use for this particular area. So being that it's gonna be built off this bathroom wall, I didn't have the heart to bury this nice cedar siding with this enclosure. So I decided to rip it off to hopefully be able to use it in the future and to give me a blank canvas to start from. I'm going with the traditional fixed location concept. This will allow me to store my sheet goods horizontally, preventing any of the bowing or potato chipping that I was getting from storing them vertically against a wall. This will also give me the additional space above to build that 3D print enclosure. Every project needs a solid foundation. It's never fun getting halfway through, realizing things aren't plumb or level, requiring wonky cuts or dealing with alignment issues. So the first order of business was laying the groundwork. I started by building the base frames, and using shims, I leveled it out before securing it. This will create a level foundation for the rest of the build. There will actually be three of these in total, one for the plywood compartment, one for the printer enclosure base, and the third will serve as the lid for the structure. I'm known to typically over-engineer my projects. That's a fancy way of saying you don't know what you're doing. But I've got good reasoning for this one. If you're unfamiliar with 3D printing or the particular brand of printers, it can be surprising how much they vibrate or can shake the platform they are resting on. So I wanted to plan for that early on and hopefully prevent that. Secondly, I used the above space for this bathroom as overflow storage. And this enclosure will ultimately add more available space up top. So I wanted to make sure I didn't run into any weight restrictions down the road. Now, before getting this plywood enclosure, well, too enclosed, I installed the floor sheeting. So I used this three quarter inch melamine in hopes that the slick plastic surface would help make sliding the full sheets in and out a lot easier. I used two by material as supports for the overhang, but also to provide more places to firmly secure the outer plywood sheeting. So I was mostly kidding about that rolling plywood storage cart comment that I made earlier. I actually think it can be a great solution for many, but in my particular application and the constant chaotic mess that my shop's normally in, it just wasn't gonna work out. So don't hate me, it was a joke. So naturally I got excited and loaded up all my sheet goods inside the skeleton of the storage compartment. But I realized I jumped the gun and this is only gonna make getting the face frame material installed a complete nightmare. Idiot! With the lower half framed, I moved on to installing the three quarter inch plywood for the printer enclosure floor. Now this really helped lock everything into place, but I still have another trick up my sleeve that I'll use later on to help mitigate that vibration concern. Before continuing this build upwards, I wanted to get the power for the equipment in this enclosure pulled over to the location before I had more obstacles to work around. Continuing the upper construction in a similar fashion as the lower half, but instead this time, I'll be making sure to keep the front face as free from obstruction as possible. And this is because later on, I'll be installing four sliding glass doors with custom built track that they'll slide in. This will allow me to maintain good access to the inside, but also keep the dust out. Once again, avoiding future frustration, I decided to slap some primer and paint on the inside walls before the access was reduced. At this point, I had the option of going multiple directions. So I decided on installing the exterior covering on the lower half. The setup is roughly eight and a half feet tall, and I wanted to ensure that I had a full sheet covering the face of the printer enclosure section. This will give me a more seamless appearance after cutting the large opening out and eliminating more seams to be filled prior to painting. So I used this roughly eight inch piece at the bottom to give me the proper sheet placement as I moved upward. And do you remember when I said I screwed up by loading up all my sheet goods into the storage compartment? Well, this is where it caught up with me. I mean, who doesn't like moving all of their sheet goods around their shop multiple times? 
I wanted to use as much of my existing offcuts as I could, helping to keep the cost down and to conserve my on hand full sheet supply. So for the face, I used these slightly oversized pieces of MDF to trim out the front. Then I came back and flush trimmed them with my router for a clean look. Now I'm a huge fan of MDF, but damn, the amount of dust and mess it creates when routering is unreal. So before I install the rest of the exterior sheeting on the upper half of the structure, I wanna button up that electrical that I ran over here earlier. I had this massive power strip laying around, and this will be the perfect use for it. I say massive because this power strip is designed for three separate 30 amp circuits split between 42 positions. And it also has a real-time display of actual current values on each circuit. But I needed to modify it first. So I'll only be feeding this with two 20 amp circuits, but I still wanted all 42 positions to be powered up. So without beating a dead horse, I thought I could maybe explain that a little bit better on what I was actually doing. So this power strip was actually designed to be ran in a three phase system. So each of those phases fed 14 of the receptacles out of the 42. So in my scenario, I'm feeding it with single phase. So what I did is made it to where one of my circuits fed 14 of the receptacles and the other phase fed the remaining 28. So I just kind of split it up a little bit differently. All right, so before I could mount this power strip, I needed to come up with some sort of mounting bracket for it. So I did come up with a design and then I sent that over to my 3D printer and let it do its thing. Now I have to say, this is probably one of the biggest reasons why I got into 3D printing in the first place. Now, I'm a big time tinker. I just like screwing around in my shop and building random stuff. But there's nothing quite like coming up with an idea, designing it, and then watching it print and come to life right before your eyes. It's a super cool, a satisfying feeling that you get. Now the last little punch list item before finishing the upper exterior sheeting was installing the top cover. Now this is nothing fancy, just a half inch piece of OSB cut to size and then screwed in place. So installing the upper face sheet was pretty straightforward, but I did a couple things to help plan for the future steps. First was installing the temporary melamine border around the face frame. This will give me a slight lip around the front opening, which will conceal the track that my glass panels will slide in. I used some scrap wood to help hold that sheet in place while getting it secured. Once the lower cut was complete, I used shims to support the piece prior to making that top cut. And after getting it halfway through that top cut, I used some more scraps to help keep that large piece from flipping out, knocking me off the ladder and cutting my face off of the router. It's not funny, I've seen it happen. Oh and using plastic was definitely a good call. It helped contain that router mess and made it a lot easier to pick up. I did the exact same thing on the end, but using MDF. This opening will just have a stationary piece of glass for viewing purposes. I'll spare your time with the hole filling and the boring paint process, but I did apply several coats of Zinsser 123 primer. I really love this stuff. And then I followed up with a few coats of an off-brand matte black finish. All right, so I still have a handful of loose items to finish up on my to-do list. I got climate control, lighting, vibration dampening, some sliding glass doors, and then a creative way to make it a little bit easier to access the printer enclosure portion of this project. So I'm not gonna lie, this is when the project really took off for me because of all the creative problem solving that was gonna be involved. So uh, less talky-talky and more worky-worky. That sounded a lot better in my head, so let's just jump into it. So the first item on that list I wanna check off is climate control. So my main shop is heated and insulated, but the only time I'm really running the heat in my shop is when I'm physically out here working in it. So that means during the coldest times of the year, if I'm not out here working, my shop's getting down to 35 or 39 degrees, and I think I can do better for this 3D print enclosure. Now, when I had this shop built, I had a bathroom installed, but the main part of the shop wasn't insulated or heated, so it was important that I installed its own heat source and insulated it very well. So I wanna share some of that conditioned air and direct it into my 3D print enclosure. Now, how I'm gonna do that is I purchased two media console fans off of Amazon, and I'm gonna 3D print my own air duct for them. So my thought is to have one of the fans be pulling the warm or cool air from my bathroom into the enclosure, and then the other fan directing that same enclosure air back into the bathroom, creating a vortex to hopefully give me more of a consistent air temperature. But the big thing is, I wanna automate that. But before I could do that, there was still one minor detail that I needed to finish. There's still a large opening cut from the front of this enclosure. So as it sits, it's not gonna do a very good job at keeping that nice conditioned air inside, nor is it gonna do a good job at keeping the dust from my shop on the outside. So my plan for tackling that is building four sliding glass doors. Not only will this do a good job at keeping the dust from my shop on the outside, this will allow me to retain full access to the inside. 
So I've got a friend that owns a glass shop here locally, and he was able to cut me four pieces of quarter inch glass to accommodate this. It was just up to me to supply the track the glass slides in. Now you can buy pre-made aluminum track just for this, but due to the length and the quantity, it was gonna cost me upwards of $200. So in classic brew builds form, I thought to myself, why can't I build my own track and maybe save a few bucks doing it? So with a 3D printer at my disposal, I decided to build my own track. Now this does create a couple design hurdles that I'll have to overcome. And the biggest one being, due to the opening in my enclosure being just under 90 inches, and the limitations of my printer not allowing me to be able to print in 90 inch pieces of track, it meant I was gonna have to print these in multiple pieces. Now the fitment was important because if it fit too tight, it'd make it difficult to slide the glass side to side, but if it fit too loose, I'd get that annoying sound from the vibration of the printers. Now speaking of vibration, and before I got this glass installed, I wanted to experiment with this cheap floor matting that I got at Harbor Freight in hopes that it would help cancel out or dampen that vibration that I was concerned about earlier. Now this four pack was under 20 bucks, and aside from cutting an inch and a half off one side of all four pieces, the stuff fit pretty much perfectly inside the enclosure. All right, moment of truth. Did I completely waste my time? Oh, ho, ho. I think I nailed it. I think I nailed it. Dirty ass glass though. With the glass doors chalked up as a win, I felt like this was a good time to get my printer acquainted with its new home. And of course, to break that enclosure in with the first print, I decided to print some simple door handles to make opening these glass doors a lot easier. Then making sure they were aligned, I attached them with a small amount of clear silicone, cleaning up any of the squeeze out with rubbing alcohol. along with printing some clips to mount that stationary piece of glass on the end. So to get this automated, I got some help from my friends over at Miro's. Now initially, I was on the hunt for LED strip lights to install in this enclosure and to add a little extra flair. And Miro's caught my eye not only due to their reasonable pricing, but their ability to mesh seamlessly with Apple HomeKit. I reached out to ask some questions and to see if they were willing to help me out with some lights. And once they caught wind of my project and what I was trying to do, they directed me to a couple of their other items that they thought would help me in my end game. The first item was their smart temperature and humidity sensor, and the other item was their smart outlets. The sensor not only allows you to remotely view the temperature or humidity of a room or an item from your phone, it also communicates with other devices on your network and allows you to set triggers for different actions. This allowed me to set high and low temperature trigger points to turn the fans on and off to regulate the enclosure temperature. They wanted to pass along a discount to all you viewers, so use BrewBuilds10 at checkout to receive 10% off your next purchase. So you've probably noticed throughout this video the height of that enclosure and my personal lack of height, and I've wondered how easily accessible it actually is. Well, in short, it's not. It's less than ideal, but this is a problem that I knew I was gonna have to address down the road. So here we are down the road, and this is how I tackled it. So full disclaimer, the easiest and probably best approach would have been to either buy or build a basic step stool to give me that additional height needed, but I feel like this project needed something special. It needed a ladder, but not just any ordinary ladder. It needed to be one of them custom rolling library ladders. And of course, to add a whole nother level of difficulty to it and purchasing that prepackaged hardware like a sellout, I decided to build my own from scratch. Now the construction of this ladder was fairly basic. I used two by six material for both the rails and the steps. And I decided on a 10 degree slope for this ladder. Now I found that to be a happy medium between not being too vertical and then also not taking up a whole bunch of real estate in front of this enclosure. So to cut those 10 degree dados in the rails, I used my router and a jig. And then to make matching bevels in the steps to match those 10 degree rails, I used my joiner. Now the technique I used is kind of uncommon. You typically only edge joint one edge and then you clean up the other edge on either a table saw or maybe a planer. But I found that using this on both ends in this application has proven to work very well for me in the past. So I was able to use it on this particular application and it allowed me to sneak up on that cut, getting those steps to fit those rails nice and perfect.
Now to get this ladder to roll, there's a couple things that I need to build. So these ladders need some sort of rail system to kind of guide them along a track. So to accommodate that, I used a piece of one inch black iron pipe that I had left over from my shop gas heater install. Now coupled with that, I need a rolling assembly that's actually attached to the ladder that will incorporate some type of roller. So for the roller, I used my printer to print me a perfectly sized roller to match that one inch pipe, but to also be able to accommodate a bearing to give me that nice free rolling operation I was looking for. Now the last feature it needs is some sort of wheel at the base of this that will not only carry the weight of myself, but the ladder and allow it to roll across that floor. So for these, I just use some basic stationary casters from Home Depot. So the first trial run of this ladder actually worked out better than I expected. It rolls nicely, it works as expected. The one minor tweak that I need to make to it is how it's captured to that upper rail. So currently it's just from the weight of myself and the natural angle of the ladder. And I think the lower wheels are misaligned because it wants to kind of roll in an arc, which forces the leading roller up top to kind of work its way away from that rail. I found if I just roll into position, climb up it and then climb back down, it works as intended. But if I decide to get crazy and ride the ladder down the rail, there's a chance that it might derail and ultimately kill me. All right, so here it is in all of its massive glory. It's probably the most complicated plywood storage compartment you'll see, but it does have a couple extra features that the other ones don't have, so it comes with a little bit of justification. So the lower half gives me plenty of horizontal storage. I do want to make a separate rack here on the side to accommodate these smaller offcuts to help kind of declutter the main compartment and just making it more dedicated to the full sheets or mostly full sheets. Now throughout the video, I talked about all the benefits in my opinion of storing my sheet goods horizontally, whether it's preventing the bowing or allowing me to build up vertically and accommodate or, or save some more valuable shop space. But the one drawback or downside is it can be cumbersome at loading the sheets in or taking them out, especially the heavier ones like MDF or melamine. So I'm making a little dolly system to kind of help me roll the sheet goods out, just making things a little bit easier. All right, so for the main feature, this 3D print enclosure, this was awesome. It definitely does a great job at keeping my dust from the wood shop from getting to my 3D printer. These sliding glass doors work awesome. They, they open and close great on the, on the track there. And I will say this is not 100% sealed off, so I'm sure with time, dust will find its way in there, but it just makes it more manageable and gives me a little bit of peace of mind doing my woodworking while having my 3D printers inside the shop and not have to worry about covering them up or moving them all together. So I built this to accommodate four printers and an AMS setup or multiple AMS setups down the road. So it's got room for expansion or growth as my, my needs up provide. And this Harbor Freight mat's actually proven to work very well for dampening that vibration. And I think in the video I said it was about 20 bucks. It was actually $9.99 for those four sheets. And like I said, it's, it's working great. So that was a, a solid find. Now, as far as the products that I installed in this cabinet, I'll link Miros and the products that I used of theirs in my description down below. They were easy to work with, the products were nice. And at the end of the day, I was gonna purchase those lights with my own money. And it just happened at the last minute that I said, hey, I'm gonna reach out to them and see if maybe they'll send me some lights to install on this enclosure, which they did. And then on top of that, they said, hey, let us know if there's anything else that would help your project. We'd be more than happy to send it to you. So that's when I uh, found the Wi-Fi thermostat. And then I realized all the features that it had between you know, remote viewing the, the humidity or temperature of the, the room, or in this case, the enclosure, but the ability for it to actually communicate with other smart devices on your network. So I went back and purchased those Wi-Fi outlets with my own money, which allowed me to give that thermostat a option or a device to turn on and off being an outlet. So the, the fans are plugged into that. So I set my high and low temperatures which signaled the outlets to turn on and off, ultimately turning those fans on. Now, the other cool feature is the sensor itself, which is that puck that you saw me install. The black face on it is actually a solar panel that maintains the battery of the unit. So you don't have to worry about dead batteries and it not working. There's enough light in your shop or office or home 
to actually satisfy that, that solar panel and to maintain a battery. Cool, cool feature, definitely happy with them. So check them out if you have anything you're looking at that you wanna automate or something for your home. So the fans I used, I got those off Amazon. I have no affiliation, but the, the company was AC Infinity. These fans are designed for like a media entertainment center type application where you're trying to cool off some devices or electronics. So I was kind of, I wasn't sure what I was gonna get, but they showed up. They were super high quality, super quiet. I got the two of them and those seem to be working well for uh, regulating the temperature of this enclosure as it is. But I do plan on adding a third one that I can actually uh, uh, use as an exhaust fan to vent the inside air of this enclosure to the outside of my shop. Now, sometimes I print with ABS or ASA and both of those produce a toxic fume and it's not good to breathe in. So it'd be nice to be able to vent that outside when I am using those materials. All right, so this rolling death trap. This was a complete creative challenge. I decided to do this at the last minute. The latter portion of it was pretty straightforward, but I wanted to see if I could build my own rolling hardware. And I thought it was fun combining 3D printing and woodworking together to, to make one solution. And it works out nice. It rolls, it's definitely usable. It's just a little impractical. I definitely think using a standard store-bought step stool or even a, just a custom built one would be more than enough for what I needed. But it was fun, it was just an extra little talking point or flair for this project here. But ultimately, this was a lot of fun. This definitely solved two of the issues that I was having. I know I brought these up in my shop tour video, so hopefully you watched that and you kind of expected something like this. But I wanna say, the shop's not gonna clean itself, so grab a broom. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys on the next one.